I had a telephone conversation with Martin, who some of you will know. He is a retired clergy friend of mine back in the UK. I told him I had to write a sermon on 1 Kings 8 and was now wondering why I had chosen that passage. Preaching on the Old Testament isn't easy, I said. You have to explain the passage in its own terms and say what it means for us as Christians today. Martin agreed. He said that increasingly readings were being taken from only the Gospels and Epistles, ignoring the Old Testament. I added my two pennyworth, we were on a roll, and said that when I'd come to the Cranmer Group, where I'd been before HT, they'd only had readings from the New Testament. Someone then asked me why I was now having Old Testament readings, as she thought the New Testament had replaced the Old. In a parish council meeting at the Cranmer Group, one of my wardens asked why I included a psalm at morning prayer as he felt they were out of date. Friends, no part of the Bible is ever out of date. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Article 7 says, the Old Testament is not contrary to the New, for both in the Old and the New Testament, everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ. But, I'll agree that unpacking the Old Testament uh, can take a bit of work by me and by you. Last Sunday we looked at Solomon, Israel's third king, and mentioned two attributes of his. He was wise and he was rich. There's something else that Solomon is known for, something he did or achieved, to which his wisdom and wealth contributed. It was mentioned last week in chapter 3 and as a major feature of this week's reading. To what am I referring? Big voice, Prisca. The building of the temple. Well done. Gold star. The building of the temple. And quite a temple it was. It was big. 90 feet by 30 feet and 45 feet high and featured lots of gold. So much so it uh, made Donald Trump's taste for gilding seem quite restrained. Likewise, the festival that marked its dedication was quite a spectacle. Please turn to 1 Kings 8, page 332 in the Church Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 8, page 332, and verse 1. Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs, of the Israelite families to bring up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Zion, the city of David. This might have to be our first bit of unpacking. Aren't Jerusalem, Zion, and the city of David the same thing? The NIV Study Bible comes to our rescue. Regarding Zion, it tells us, Originally, 
the name was given to the southernmost hill of the city on which the Jebusite fortress was located. As the city expanded from the days of Solomon onward, the name was applied to the entire city. What about the Ark of the Lord's Covenant? Verse 9 tells us, There was nothing in the Ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. When I was young, I used to think the line, he only is the maker of all things near and far, in the hymn, we plough the fields and scatter, was somewhat mealy-mouthed. Wasn't being the maker of all things near and far good enough, I wondered. Indeed, I'm surprised, given people's penchant for revising things, that this has never been changed to he alone is the maker. We should see the fact that there was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb in this light. But the stone tablets on which were inscribed the Ten Commandments were a big deal. So big a deal that it was right that they should be on their own without accompanying clutter. A word about the fact that there were two tablets. The tablets marked the covenant God had made with his people, Old Testament Israel. A covenant is akin to a contract. We're used to the fact that when a contract is entered into, both parties have a copy. In this instance, both copies, God's and Israel's, were kept in the ark. Basically, a storage box, if an important one. The tent of meeting of verse 4, also called the tabernacle, was the precursor to the temple. It was a portable structure Moses had constructed to house the Ark of the Covenant and be God's dwelling place in the midst of his people Israel. It was where the people were able to meet with God. But meeting with God, be it at the tent of meeting or at the temple, was not a straightforward affair. It required priests who were drawn from just one of Israel's 12 tribes, the Levites. These priests acted as intermediaries between the people and God. And they didn't come empty-handed. Entry into God's presence involved sacrifice. In this instance, we may presume that Solomon paid for the animals involved. In our passage, it's as if the sensibilities of uh, vegetarians are being considered. We're merely told that there were so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. But the truth of the matter is let slip in verse 63. 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. 
I can't help thinking about uh, modern day sensitivity about cooking smells not intruding in the worship space. This remained Jewish practice right up to Jesus' day. Uh, bear in mind that Solomon lived just under a thousand years before Christ. Forty days after Jesus' birth, Joseph and Mary took him to the temple, where they offered a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons, Luke 2.24. In fact, uh, they were going for the cheaper option. If they could have afforded it, the sacrifice should have been a lamb and a pigeon or dove. When I say they offered a sacrifice, I don't mean that Mary and Joseph themselves were allowed to do this. No, the process first involved changing regular money into temple money. Then, the animals had to be bought from temple-approved traders. By Jesus' day, the whole process had become a right money-making racket, leading to Jesus' cleansing of the temple intervention. How are things different for us as Christians? What difference did Jesus make? quite apart from the fact that he upset a few tables. Jesus made, makes, all the difference. The temple no longer exists. It was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Even the Jews can no longer offer sacrifice there. But... Before that, at Jesus' death, God intervened to mark the temple's demise. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew 27, 51. In Solomon's day, the temple was divided into sections. There was, verse 6, the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place. There was, verse 8, the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary. The priests, Levites, could go so far. Only the high priest could enter into the inner sanctuary and only once a year. What if he fell ill while in there? That had been thought of. He had bells on his garment. If they stopped tinkling, he could be pulled out by means of a rope tied to his leg. If you were a Jewish man, who wasn't a priest, you could go so far. If you were a Jewish woman, you were kept farther out. If you were a Gentile or non-Jew, farther still. And no one could go anywhere without the shedding of blood, making sacrifice for sin. In the New Testament's book of Hebrews, Chapter 10, verse 11, we read, Day after day, every priest in the temple stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, 
Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In our service, we will shortly be hearing these words. God gave his only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself, once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. All that used to go on in the temple, all that it represented, is no longer required. Do not confuse my role with that of the priest of the temple. I am not a sacrificing priest, but rather a presbyter or teaching elder. Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament law's demands through his death on our behalf on the cross. We can have direct access to God without the need of any mediator other than our great high priest, Jesus. All that is required of us is to believe in him, to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Saviour. Have you done so? Will you do so today? Verse 10. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. When I was in my first year at uh, Durham University, I was a member of a Bible study group at my college. David Pritchett, who attended Emmanuel Charismatic House Church, was also a member. If truth be known, I was a bit in awe of him. He was a third year student, and I was a sproggy fresher. He went to an all singing, all dancing church. I was boring. C of E, perhaps trying to impress him. I told him of a clergyman, I think it may have been my vicar in Birmingham, who was so caught up in the spirit of the moment that he lost his place in the liturgy. Glory be, said David, and I earned my brownie points. The theme of cloud representing God's presence recurs in the Bible. In the wilderness, the Lord went ahead of the Israelites in a pillar of cloud. When Moses met with God on Mount Sinai, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. Exodus 40, 35. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. At Jesus' transfiguration, while Peter was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them and... They were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. We worship a God who is just as holy, just as other, as he was 
in Solomon's day. Unlike those of Solomon's day, we can enter God's immediate presence, regardless of who we are, Jew or Gentile, male or female. But do not be presumptuous in doing so. Remember in whose name we come. Remember who paid the price of our admission and how he did so. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavour, but by the blood of the Lamb. Into your presence you call us, you call us to come. Into your presence you draw us, and now by your grace we come. Lord, if you mark our transgressions, who would stand? Thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen.